Good evening, good evening, Chester. Good evening, Chester. I feel like I need to spread some compost love first to get the love in the room. I know I got a difficult task because we all full of tacos and all that good stuff, but I want to thank Delaware County. I want to thank Delaware County for inviting me up here. This has been a long time in the making. Me and Mike Ewald have been talking about this since we attended our anti-incineration conference with the Global Incinerator Network community in Detroit that he was going to get me to come to Chester, Pennsylvania. I was able to spread a little compost fever through a Zoom call that we had about a year ago. And now I'm here to speak to you in person. And I'm hoping the next step would be for me to help you come and set up your community compost infrastructure. And but before I get started, because you know how I need energy in order to do my thing, I prepared something very special for you. It's a spoken word. My first time doing spoken word, I got an opportunity to speak at South by Southwest about how composting can help prevent climate change. It came to me about 4 o'clock in the morning. I called my mother at 50 years old and told her I wanted to hear this poem at 4 o'clock in the morning. She listens because she's such a good mom, and she gave me her blessing. So is it okay if I share it with you guys? All right, excellent, excellent. Let's get this started. It'll be a long journey down environmental justice road. That Cavanta smokestack creates cleaner, greener energy, is what we were told. In order to shut it down, we must have unity. So I went on a composting mission with the youth to feed the soil and feed the community. While others took blood money from the incinerator, I remained the environmental OG and stayed to the cold. Frustrated, locked myself in Filbert Street Garden teaching the youth how to make that black gold. To be a voice for the voiceless was our goal. We did our research because we poor, we got to breathe in coal. When I think about it, I get infrared and I ask you, Chester, why does our organic material have to be incinerated? Breathing in carbon dioxide and methane gas must be of the past. So I ask you, how long will this environmental injustice last? We don't have much time. Climate change is happening fast. Composting is a member of this supporting cast. Great for the environment to help reduce harmful greenhouse gas. In my city, like Chester, environmental racism is dominant. But when you add compost to the soil, it sequesters carbon and so great for the environment. So if your air is within my range, let's continue to spread compost fever to combat climate change. This is my first environmental justice poem, so it's just a taste. But remember, compost, a rhyme is a terrible thing to waste. Excellent, excellent. So I'm all fired up, ready to go. Chester, thank you so much for once again having me come out. I have to give you a disclaimer before I get started. As you mentioned, I am a compost fever long hauler. Me and my youth have been passing compost fever throughout Baltimore City, causing a compost pandemic through the variant of education because we know when you know better, you do better. In Baltimore City, 75% of our organic material, excuse me, of our waste can be composted, recycled, or reused. So if we divert that material from going into the incinerator, we're going to starve the incinerator. We know they're going to keep it open. They're going to continue to kill the people in this neighborhood, but we're going to starve it. We're going to divert that material. So I run a youth-led food scrap collection service. We serve an amazing garden called the Filbert Street Garden. The Filbert Street Garden was created because it's in a food desert, food insecure neighborhood where it takes my youth compost and the residents about an hour to get to a market that's not filled with GMOs and processed foods. So Filbert Street Garden was created so residents can grow their own food. So me and my youth collect food scraps from about eight neighborhoods in the city and I'm pleased to correct my introduction that now we have a 225 customers. We are diverting about 3,000 pounds on a monthly basis from going into the landfills and incinerate. And it's all youth powered, youth that come from this community that's been a dumping ground for these toxic organizations, just like in Chester. And where Curtis Bay Garden is located, there are two incinerators the Wheeler Brader Incinerator and a Medical Waste Incinerator. John Hopkins Hospital, if anybody is aware of John Hopkins Hospital, one of the most famous hospitals, they, bur they burn their waste in Curtis Bay, but they get money for asthma and cancer treatment. 
and they get money for ANSA and CASMA uh, research, but they're burning their waste right in Curtis Bay, along with a chemical company, a uh, coal plant that sits right across the street from Curtis Bay Recreation Center, an Amazon fulfillment center. We've had explosions and fires, so my job was to uh, inspire the youth in that community to be environmental justice leaders for their community and teach their uh, residents and their constituents about where their trash goes, what happens to it when it gets there, and how it affects that community. It causes the city of Baltimore $55 million in health damages a year. They put these in poor neighborhoods. But one thing about the wind, we all know that it doesn't segregate or discriminate, so we all are breathing in bad air. So it's all our responsible uh, all our responsibility to divert that organic material from going into, and you see I haven't used the word waste one time today because I don't waste anything. I feed the soil that feeds the community. You have to feed the soil that feeds you. So you can take that organic material, turn it, and put it through a process. Uh, since we're pre uh, spreading compost fever, we're going to get into a little education. Composting is nothing but the decomposing of your organic material like your coffee grinds, your, uh, your food scraps, vegetable scraps, your tea bags, your garden trimmings, turned into this beautiful black humus that we love to call black gold. Uh, Filbert Street Garden also is a living classroom. Uh, there we rescue animals. Uh, my youth composter, Mr. Kenneth Moss, which you see on this picture right now, he started out with me when he was 15 years old. Uh, we've had seven youth composters all come from Ben Franklin High School, which is located in the community. Uh, Kenny grew his first tomato at Filbert Street Garden, and now he's one of the environmental, youth environmental justice leaders for his community. Uh, he has took his entrepreneurial skills that he learned from the Baltimore Compost Collective and started his own business called Kenneth Captures, just a kid with a camera. His ambitions is to become a National Geographic photographer where he would go all around the country and take pictures of soil. He is uh, definitely uh, invested in making sure that his community is not a dumping ground for these toxic sites by collecting buckets from 225 households. Um, I don't know how many young people that would be up on Sunday mornings at 6.30 in the morning to pick up food scraps, but if we raise our children the right way, I had him since 15. If I call Kenneth right now, he'll tell you one of our amazing stands. We stay ready so we don't have to get ready. So we gotta give our young people, we gotta pass that torch. A lot of us in this room have more time in back of us than what we have in front of us. So it's our responsibility to create those next environmental justice leaders. Um, also, we, uh, you know, I can't shut that incinerator down by myself. It has to be a collective effort. That's why we're called the Baltimore Compost Collective. So we work with the Office of Sustainability, uh, Institute for Local Self-Reliance, uh, Rockefeller Foundation, and we have been able to put three bin systems throughout the community gardens in Baltimore City. Each community composting site can divert about 400 pounds of organic material from going into the landfills and incinerators. So I'm hoping that Chester will adopt the same practice because we need to know our farmer. Most of the food that you're buying from markets, unfortunately in poor neighborhoods, are GMOs. A lot of people don't even know or are aware of the codes that can tell you where your food. So know your farmer, grow your own food. Take your food scraps and put them, feed the soil that's going to feed you. Put those right in through the process of composting. Uh, we also have got very creative. We have compost drop-off sites at uh, two farmers markets. And what the creative thing that we've done, this is not nothing new. We haven't reinvented the wheel. We uh, have a farmer who's a hog farmer at the farmers market. We give him all of the food scraps and he feeds those to his hog. Such a sustainable way to deal with our scraps. Nothing that we haven't been doing. Caribbean countries, when you go to the farmers market, where do you see, you see the goats sitting right there, they eat that, you take that manure, you compost it because it's high in nitrogen, and you make some beautiful, beautiful, beautiful black gold. So we're able to do that also. We have, uh, we have gave DPW, which is Department of Public Works, who pays Wheeler Brader and Senator $11 million to burn trash. Myself with the Energy Justice Network and the other environmental justice leaders in Baltimore have gave them compost fever. Now they have drop-off sites at the DPW drop-off sites where it's, um, it's not perfect yet, but it's whole. 
to a large scale composting facility and recycle, but we could do that in Baltimore. So what I'm asking for them to do is give me a large scale composting facility so that I can turn hustlers into haulers, I can turn scrappers, trappers into scrappers through the, the current of composting and divert that material from going in, give them an opportunity to work clean jobs cleaner and greener jobs. I believe in my, uh, I might not be correct, Mike will uh, correct me if I'm not, but if you compost uh, instead of incineration, you can create four times more jobs, two times more jobs than the landfills and the incinerators. So we have a prime opportunity here. And guys, don't wait for the city of Chester to build you a table. You will have to build your own table. Don't wait for them to build the table. Start composting. If you can start just diverting, you get one garden started. It can take 400 pounds. Uh, I'm sure we have a bunch of community gardens here in Chester. If we can give them the skills and the proper practices so they can compost without having an urban rabbit issue, because I know some people in this room say, Marvin, it caught, anybody know what an urban rabbit is? Yes. Urban rabbit is a Baltimore city rat, but I'm sure it's a Chester city rat as well. So that'll avoid rats and odors. You always want to put a compost filter, a carbon filter. You never want to see any exposed food scraps. Um, there's a such thing of cold composting. A lot of people tell me, Marvin, I've been composting for years. That's when you just take your food scraps and you throw them in your backyard and you bury them. That's cold composting. Yes, it's going to compost, but it's going to take a year. What I want to bring to the city is hot composting that takes a little bit more effort where you are measuring your carbon and your nitrogen resources. And I'm going to give you the secret recipe for every one part nitrogen. You're going to add two part carbons. You're going to add water, 60% moisture, and you're going to need air. And you have to flip those piles because we know that if you stay active in those compost piles and you're flipping them, and it takes a lot of work that those urban rabbits won't go into those piles and you won't have an urban rabbit issue. So you're in a prime opportunity to starve the incinerator, Chester. Um, to starve that incinerator. If you compost and recycle the way that you're supposed to, you'll need a five gallon container for your waste, but you have to divert those materials. So what you can do for me right now, if you're asking what you can do right now, I want you to keep three waste stations at your home. One for your waste, one for your recyclables, and one for your compost. And we're gonna work on some places to take that compost throughout the community to be able to drop that off. And you're gonna teach your children. You're gonna have them take the stickers off of those bananas before they put them in that compost pile. So when you're sifting them, you won't have any contaminants. So once again, at the Baltimore Compost, and if everybody can repeat after me, the Baltimore Compost Collective, what we're gonna do in Baltimore City, what we're gonna do in Chester, we're gonna, I want everybody to repeat after me, compost, compost. starve the incinerator, starve the incinerator. Feed, the soil. feed the soil, feed the community, feed the community. and we're going to do this together, we're going to do this together, we're going to do this together. So uh, we uh, also, my youth, I have been able to, um, you know, sometimes when you have your uh, food scraps, when you open it up, what's the first thing that kind of happens? It's the smell, so it comes to you a little smelly. But anybody smell black gold once it's been put through a process? So sometimes my youth come to me and they don't have a birth certificate, they don't have a social security card, they don't have a cover letter, they don't have a resume, uh, they don't have public speaking skills, they don't know how to do an elevator uh, pitch. So the same way we take that organic material, not waste, we put them through a process and we empower them so they can be the next environmental justice leader. So I'm charging everybody in this room to bring a young person along with you as you're fighting this battle so that the work continues on when you go and you move on and you're not able and you don't have the energy because you can get burned out doing this work really quickly. So you want to make sure, so I'm encouraging you and I'm able to show you if anybody would love to come to the Wakanda of South Baltimore for a tour, please reach out to me. Uh, the reason why I call it the Wakanda of South Baltimore, one of my favorite quotes from the Black Panther movies, in times of crisis, why the foolish build barriers, the wise build bridges. So Chester, let's build that bridge. 
Let's starve that incinerator. Let's feed the soil that feeds you. Let's empower youth to be those next environmental justice. Let's teach them entrepreneurial skills through composting. Um, I am willing to come up and do training with you along with the Institute for Local self Reliant with our Soul Rebuilder program, where we will teach you to train the trainer program because what happens at most compost sites is people get burned out. So you wanna have somebody who is enthusiastic that wants to do the work so the work continues. When you're doing your drop off site, just don't have people drop off. You know, um, I have been so blessed. Um, got an opportunity to go to Detroit who closed one of the largest incinerators in the country, in the country, but they didn't have a community composting infrastructure. So I went in there and I trained them and now they're working, they're able to train other community gardens. So the compost love just grows and grows and grows and we're able to divert that stuff from now going into that landfill. Because when you burn trash, it creates carbon dioxide. When you bury it, it creates methane gas. So we don't want to put it in the landfill. We want to be able to, we don't have to increase the trash days. We just have to divert that material. And we have to come up with that structure and be able to do it. And yes, yeah, it'll take a little bit more time, but it'll save a life. Um, they spoke about my work with the Open Society Institute. My goal was to educate the affected youth of Baltimore City and Curtis Bay. When I go into schools to do composting workshops, I ask two questions, uh, especially in my community that's similar to Chester. When Michael took me on the toxic tour right before we came in here, um, if I closed my eyes, I would think I was in Curtis Bay. Um, I, I would love for people to do research along with redlining. There's a thing called yellow lining where they put all the toxic uh, institutions in these poor neighborhoods. But when I go in to do workshops, I ask two questions. One, what's your favorite fruit and vegetable? Because it can be, it can be composted. And then I ask them, is anybody affected by asthma or cancer? 95% of the students raise their hand and say that they have asthma. They tell me stories about their pop-pop and my mom who are fighting cancer or have died from cancer. So guys, this is a real thing. Our children are dying. Uh, yes, it will we say it's too much problem to, to separate our organic material from our waste? We gotta take that chance. Climate change is happening. Yellowstone Park is underwater. Florida is gonna be underwater before uh, most of us leave here. So your children gonna ask you, what part did you play? Why didn't you teach me how to compost? And we gotta put that curriculum, I saw on the board, we gotta put recycling curriculums in poor neighborhoods. We don't get the privilege of learning about recycling. We were just taught, that just, we didn't care, we just wanted to get the trash out the house. Six years ago, I didn't know anything about compost, and now I got a worm bin feed my vegetables and my food scraps to my worms doing vermiculture. So Chester, I'm just here to show you that it can be done and we can empower our youth to do it. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Remember compost around is a terrible thing to waste and let's continue to spread compost love and understand that we can't build barriers, we gotta build bridges. So we're gonna build that bridge. We might can't get to zero waste, but we can get to 95%. We can get to 95%, but we got to believe that and we got to put action behind it. So thank you so much, Chester, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much. We've got about 10 minutes. We can take questions. Um, well, um, if you're talking about Baltimore, I need to live right off the coast of Manhattan. Yes, sir. I'm from Sandtown, Winchester. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm from that community. 40% of your trash come right here to Chester. 40% come right here and it's being trash. Thank you, Steve, right here. Well, if you think I'm lying, come on over 695 tomorrow morning, 4 o'clock, and you'll see 365 trucks pull up there every day. Right there on Howard Avenue by me. That's how people take so much capital. Yeah. I understand what you're talking about. Yes, sir. You all might stop a lot, but a lot still coming out of the city just the way. And they're coming even just to that incinerator. Why would we build a incinerator in a city that should have been built out there on the roof, down in Delaware, way out there in Mark Land out there? I either should have been built up there in Kennecott, out there in Mark Land. But anytime you put up, the trash is steamy, trash coming from everywhere. I work down there. I know where the trash coming from. 
and just come. But John Allen also laid some of everything from down there. They burned it up. They got three medical players down there they burned just medical equipment. And then they got a place down there they burned right in the back. And some of these people been down there, they done seen. But I know one time when we were down there, old days get run over by a truck. Try to stop them people going in. But I hope God bless us, we still be living. See, I go all over the world. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They clean up a little bit now since they got that. That thing got down there. But all before that, they just be held in moment. I just live it. Yes, sir. I just want to encourage you that you can take, I'm sure, as a. Do something with it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm just encouraging you to take your organic material, just do your part by diverting it because you understand what's going on. We need you as our elder to give this history so that we know. So I hope that you had a platform to be able, and I know how frustrated you are um, about what's going on. Yes. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to talk and we've got some people online too, so I don't want to cut you off. Is there other people? Are there other people that have questions for Martin? Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Y'all want a little bit more. Thank you. I'm glad that you said that. So we had a lot of lead in our school, in our soil at Filbert Street Garden. But when you add compost into the ground, it sequesters carbon. So we've been able to remediate that soil by feeding it with compost every year. And it's made our soil quality go up about 70% from when I started. So now we have uh, about fertilizer grade uh, soil in the area where we're putting the compost, but some of the soil on the outside that hasn't been incorporated with compost is still uh, a little toxic. Well, I've been able to do it within three years by putting compost in. Um, I would have to get a little bit more information for you. Uh-huh, it's, it's been, it took me about three years to get our soil remediated to the point where we could grow food in there. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was lead. Lead was one of the big, big, uh, that was the most that we had in our, the biggest percent of contaminants in our soil was lead. Mm -hmm. But composting sequesters carbon, put carbon into the soil. You have healthy uh, soil, healthy food, healthy vegetables. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you're working with a, a group of neighbor, neighborhoods around you, but is there any initiative across the whole city? Oh, yeah. So we're, mm -hmm. what, what, what are the messages that the city has that encourages all of the residents in the city to involve themselves in compost. Does the city offer a compost collection for the whole? Yes, I don't, I don't know if you were listening. When, when, when we, we, we've made a massive DPW has compost drop off site, what I'm finding the challenge is for neighborhoods that are very, very poor who can't get an Uber or a Lyft to one of those drop off so sites. Household level no, I know how we don't have curbside compost collection. That's what we're fighting for to okay. encourage. And that's what this program is showing because we're collecting from 215 households, 215 to 225, because some of them are just drop offs. So we do drop offs where we have community drop offs. So what I want communities to do and what you can do here in Chester is write grants for community drop offs. But you want to have someone who's trained to do those so you don't have a lot of contaminants and you don't want to just let people come drop off. You want to put them in the process. If you can not chop or you can not shovel, you can spray water. You can keep the documents so everybody can participate in composting. But we have several initiatives all around the city. We have the farmer's market drop off where the community, where all the residents of Baltimore City are encouraged to drop off and the DPW sites. And we have community drop off stations, uh, stations at our community gardens. I believe about 20 of them all around the city. And we're doing more training uh, for people to open up compost drop off sites. As I said, each community compost drop off site can uh, divert about 400 pounds of organic material from going into the landfills and incinerators. Is there also a program for backyard composting? 
No, not for, uh, so I do home composting workshops. I'm glad that you mentioned that. So DPW right now, um, we have home composting workshops where if you take the home composting workshops, you get an enclosed system. Because if we're not doing enclosed compost systems, what are we gonna have? Urban rabbits, urban rabbits. So we don't wanna have urban rabbits. So they're giving free green garden earth systems that you can buy as a municipality. They're cheaper as you buy it as a pallet load. Once people complete the home composting workshops, they receive a free home composting uh, bin system called a green garden earth system. And you guys, you can see all these amazing things on my website. If you go to the news and gallery section, I wanna encourage everybody to watch it's called Starving the Fire by Guardian Magazine that features and really speaks to our work that we're doing in Baltimore uh, to starve that incinerator and start community curbside compost pickup. When you put out your recycling bin, you would put out your uh, compost bucket. It would get taken to a large scale facility. I wanted to piggyback on something that you said. Um, gentlemen talked about Pennsylvania Avenue. I'm from the home of the unrest. Um, I live on the block where Freddie Gray was murdered. Um, and in my neighborhood, I've done just what you did. The neighborhoods got really bad. I don't know if anybody knows what a hamster dam is, but that's an open air drug market where we got scared crow police who watch the crows sell each other fentanyl and heroin and watch the crows kill each other and don't do anything. Uh, I moved back into the neighborhood to make sure my 69-year-old uh, mom is okay, and I took the house that was used as a trap house. Does anybody know what a trap house is? That's a drug house. That's where people are selling drugs. And I went to a place called Second Chance, where in Baltimore they deconstruct all the houses and they take all the good products, doors and uh, the old faucets, old trimming, uh, fireplaces, and it took me five years and I rebuilt my home from reused, repurposed, recycled material. And so it can happen. It can happen. We have amazing facility right across, second chances, right across from the wheel of Breda and Senator where they sell those products. So that's another really good model for you to use as well and creates wealth because a lot of people leave their communities. Uh, one, one of my stories, a young man named Tay Tay and his friends used to shake my rail on my row house and they would break my rail. So I got frustrated. I went to Tay Tay parents. Of course, they were disengaged. They weren't trying to hear it. Let them play, leave them alone. You can't say anything. It's no more village anymore in communities. You can't say anything to people, children. So I said, Marvin, what can you do? So I got Tay Tay and them and we fixed the rail. One day when the drug dealers weren't outside, I was sitting on my steps. Um, I have marble steps. I don't know if anybody used to clean their marble steps with Ajax and Comet. That's how I became an entrepreneur in West Baltimore, cleaning people's steps and getting their marble. But I was sitting there and Tay Tay came up to me and on my house there were originally 88 houses. Now they're only 13 uh, because they've been abandoned and been used for drug houses and they're trying to regenify my neighborhood and make it into an art district, um, as the gentleman said um, in the back. But Tay Tay said to me, Mr. Hayes, he pointed over at another abandoned house. He said, you built your house, I'm going to build that one. So stay in your communities, because you might be the only positive influence that Tay Tay may have. So. Zoom, which is... And send a compost to everybody, compost love to everybody that's online. <laughs> Does Baltimore get the schools involved? Yes, so we are trying to, uh, I have been, uh, through my OSI fellowship, I was able to educate 3,000 youth and bring them to the Wakanda of South Baltimore and teach them composting. We are trying to pay, pass legislation where we have a recycling and compost curriculum in Baltimore City Schools and we're trying to pass legislation. Baltimore County trash gets brought to Baltimore to get burnt. Uh, they are already diverting their organic material and having it going, so Baltimore City wants to do the same thing. All of the organic material that's coming from our K through 12 schools will be going to a, a transfer station and taken to a large scale facility. But once again, we don't have to do that. All we have to do is invest, and I'm not waiting for the city. I'm gonna build my own table and come up with a medium to large scale facility that's operated by community residents and youth. And, and guys, it's so important that young people see somebody. You know, you can't be what you can't see. Young people come to the garden and see that I'm a farmer. 
that I'm a beekeeper, that I'm a composter, and we had to, uh, we, were, we were brought here because we had skills of agriculture. The women used to put seeds inside of their braids because they knew they had to survive. So uh, one of my uh, campaigns is Grow Bro. So I'm encouraging you all, if you got a container, grow some tomatoes, grow the herbs that you put in your food. We're getting at the time, inflation, all this stuff, rumors of wars and wars that we're having, we have to learn how to grow our own food and we should know, don't let the enemy feed your children, know where your food comes from. Yeah. and like initiatives and guiding principles with Marvin you, you just bring everything to life so I think you know it gives everybody a real understanding of you know what excites me about this field and what what um, what the possibilities are the possibilities really are endless you just have to have spirit and creativity and resources and I'm coming back and Mr. Johnson gonna be in my home composting yeah. workshop ain't Absolutely. that right Mr. Johnson I all right come on down we'll talk after this over with all right, excellent. All right, all right.